Thank you, Clark, and thanks, Russ, for that introduction. So, local plants, we're only going to touch four of the local plants because there's so many uses of those four, and I find that it's actually more valuable to know a couple of them very well than it is to know a whole bunch of them not very well. Um, but you've got more growing in your yard that we won't cover today. The few that we're going to cover are mullein, which as you walked in, you might have noticed the two plants first and second year. We'll talk more about it. This is a single leaf off of one I couldn't get in a bucket to bring with because it was just too big, too massive to, to dig up. My wife wants it out of our garden though. So if you want a nice, healthy, huge mullein plant that's this big around, it's ready to lift out of the garden. If it doesn't disappear this week, she's going to chop it down because she doesn't want all in seeds scattering it in the garden. There's another place we might busy with that. We're going to talk about brigham tea uh, and we'll we'll dig through that one and actually take a look at, at what brigham tea is and that's local. All around us in Diamond Valley, it grows everywhere around us. We're also going to talk about chaparral which does not grow right around this, you have to go down a thousand feet to see where the chaparral starts growing. And juniper berries does grow around this. Each one of those has specific medicinal things. They're listed on the right. I won't um, spend any time talking about those medicinals right now. Let's go to the next slide so that we have a very brief introduction. I'm a master herbalist. It just means that I love that plants make the difference in our life. Yes, I have full understanding of anatomy and physiology, my schooling for that. We work with plants to correct every body system, to rebuild the body systems. Um, so for the last 25 years, I've been helping people learn how to be well for themselves. That's the purpose, is that each person takes responsibility for their own health and wellness. I do enjoy gardening. I'm still beginning to learn how to garden in this environment. We've been here five years now, and some things are growing well and producing, and other things I'm still learning. So uh, that's a, a challenge that is definitely not there. I'm not going to read this disclaimer to you. I will just say I am not a doctor. I'm not a medical anything. If you want medical advice, that's not for me. The first one I want to talk about is mullein. And if you'll glance over to your side there, there's a first year mullein plant that's small, and a second year mullein plant that shoots a stalk up. And if you've seen those, that stalk shoots up. It, the ones I've got in my yard now are tall enough I can barely reach the top of them, and they're still growing taller. So they'll get up to like 10 feet tall. And they'll put on these beautiful yellow flowers. That one has one or two on it. That's one of the smaller ones in my yard, so I can put it in a bucket and bring it in here. And by the way, if you walked past my truck and noticed that there's buckets on the back of the truck, those are supposed to move from my truck to yours tonight and go home and be planted in your yard. So anything that's in here in a bucket, those two and the ones on the back of my truck, all are either going to disappear or when they go back to my yard, they're not going back in the grass, which is where they got pulled out of. My wife doesn't want mowing seeds to get started in the grass. So she said, those all have to be disappeared. And that's the one in the garden too that's so huge. Uh, we can jump to the next slide because we're going to start talking about that first point, pain. A story to begin with then. Um, six years ago, might have been seven, my wife tripped on curbing and broke her wrist beautifully. That picture only shows a single fracture. She actually um, shattered the ball on both sides. And so that was a Friday evening. Went into the emergency room. They kindly said it and said, come back Monday when there's anybody that knows how to do the rest of this and tell you whether it needs to be um, pinned and so forth. So we went home. Winona 
could not go to sleep, the pain levels were high enough. She told them that she's allergic to and throws up as soon as she takes any of the opioid class pain relievers. And they gave her prescription for opioid class pain relievers. <laughs> she didn't fill it until about one o'clock in the morning. She says, Fred, I cannot go to sleep. The pain is too high. I can't get any sleep at all. We've got to go fill this prescription, even if it makes me sick. We went and filled the prescription, got home, two o'clock in the morning, she took one. She spent a couple hours throwing up in the bathroom. And we said, we've got to find another solution. It doesn't do any good if you're in, <laughs> in pain and throwing up. That's not a very helpful solution. So we spent the rest of the night digging through books. And she found a reference in Dr. Kisper's School of Natural Healing that said, Mullen is, an, is a narcotic strength pain reliever with no side effects. One liner, she said, we got Mullen, I am trying it. She made a cup of Mullen tea. 20, 30 seconds later, she said, now I can go to sleep. The pain is gone. Mullen is much more effective for pain relief than any of the rest of the pharmaceutical class that I've seen. The other things that Mullen does in relation to this is Mullen actually guides the bones back in place. So when we went to the doctor on Monday morning, they looked and they said, you're lined up, we don't need to do any surgery, you don't need to do anything else. And that's just after all day Saturday, all day Sunday, drinking Mullen tea about every hour and, and doing a few other things. We started taking Dr. Christopher's complete tissue and bone. I realized this isn't um, a, a class to teach you how to repair broken bones, but we've learned it really, really well from her experience and then a year later I filled and broke nine bones and so we had a chance to take everything she'd learned and then refine it a little bit. So, so complete tissue and bone ointment, uh, capsules or tea internally, need lots of calcium for bone repair of course and then microminerals, either alfalfa or kelp for microminerals and those really work well. I want to mention the benefit of Mullen in repairing joints and back though. Scoliosis in the back, damage to the back. Uh, had a gentleman come to my house this year, or just two days ago, or was it yesterday? Broken ribs, fractured his back from the fall off the house, and anytime you're repairing back, Mullen actually hydrates the cartilage and it slickens that cartilage so that as you're repairing, the cartilage and the bone will slide against each other. They'll move with each other and not cause the pain that comes from stickiness. Does that work for arthritis? It helps along with the complete tissue bone. That's topic for another time. Questions about the pain prop, pain relieving properties for healing broken or damaged things. Any questions about that? Yes, so I Christy. I don't know what the other slides are, but and we specifically talked about a pain for bones, but I'm assuming you can use it for pain for any part of the body. Yes. The only one that it depends on his headaches. And I, my father-in-law says, clears his headaches immediately. Most other people, the headache has a different cause. And so uh, I use cayenne to clear headaches, which we talked a lot about two weeks ago in the last session. So yes, it works for pretty much all structural pain. And then I'm not sure what the rest of the slides are, but What's the care on the plant? Does it require a lot of water or what kind of care do you give it? No, my monster one that's in the garden just is planted somewhere where it's had amended soil. 
That one is planted where the soil hasn't had anything. It gets watered normally. That's it. They, in fact, we transplanted mowing down from Pine Valley. This year, it is so dry, you can hardly find a plant. They're just barely up. So. And then how do you make the tea? Ah, how much do you use? Wonderful question. It's just a leaf. I see a big, big leaf. So when you take yeah. this leaf. Well, this leaf is off that monster. Okay. And making tea is as simple as any other leaf tea. Hi, Deb. Nice to see you. So, there is a caution. Go ahead and pull it, Russ. I'm going to wait. Go ahead and pull it. I just sort of lost the last thing. Oh, good. We needed that loss to decide the leaf. <laughs> so, making mullein into tea. I, I haven't ever done tea, so I have no idea. So, from I'm, hot water and I'm doing, yes, boiled water. I'm going to tear off okay. a corner or two of the mullein, stuff it in that cup, pour hot water over it, and just let it steep for 10 minutes. Mullein, I'm going to pass this around. I just shattered it, I just made a mess of it. but. I'm going to pass it around, fill that. There's a little teeny yellow flower on that that's all that fill. It's fuzzy, there's little hairs on it. When you're making tea, you want to make tea that doesn't tickle the throat or irritate the throat. Most hairs will irritate the throat. So it's got to be filtered through a cloth filter of some kind or a, a, a coffee filter. It has to be a Filtered well enough so that the hairs don't pass through. I, the machine, the processes I use, I actually put it in a mesh. What do you call that? On the top of the cup, and I'll put cheesecloth liner in that. I'll put the mullein in that. Pour the boiling water over it. I cap it to keep the heat in, and then the next. Um, you know, 10 minutes later, I'm just lifting that sieve. What do you call that thing? <laughs> Off the cup and it's already filtered. Uh, you can make it more at a time. You don't have to make it one cup at a time. Uh, so you can take a leaf that big, shred it, throw it in a pot, put two cups of boiling water over it. Don't boil leaf teas. If you boil, it'll actually lose most of the medicinal properties as it evaporates. So you just pour the boiling water in, cover it, let it steep for 10 minutes, and then filter it. And how long does the pain subside uh, for? Like a normal? It depends on you. Um, if I'm healing from broken bones or severe trauma type things to the body, it's usually every couple of hours that I need to get more in there. But you'll know. And here's the beauty of it. It doesn't take two hours to get the benefit. It's 30 seconds to a minute, and it starts absorbing in the mouth, and then you're already feeling better. So. It's nice and soft. It does work as a poultice. It's nice that way. Um, I know people that have used it for diaper rash and those kinds of things. If the skin is broken, the little hairs will actually um, stay in the skin. So I would, yeah, but no, it actually is, it, it speeds the healing and that's one of the known benefits of it. There's a chat question. Go ahead. Does it matter what stage of maturity the plant is? The leaves are always viable, but if you're dehydrating them, I take them before it starts flowering because the flower takes um, the energy from the properties. Can you be, uh, take them and dry them 
Yes. In fact, right now we're in the dry the first year leaves process. We started that early on in the season and actually dehydrated quite a bit of the first year process, the first year plant leaves. And it dries pretty quickly. Come on in. There's chairs right up front. Don't slip. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. Uh, so drying, yes, excellent to dehydrate and, and just get it stored for later. Uh, you do want to get it growing. That's why, for those of you who came in since then, there's plants sitting on the back of the truck. Those plants are intended to go into your truck or car before you leave. They're not supposed to stay in mine. Those weren't for show. Those two plants over there and those on the back of the truck were all to leave. Um, there's also some of the dried up um, seed stock in the back of the truck. Snip off a piece. There's little teeny black seeds that fall out of that and you can just scatter it in wherever you want it to grow. It puts out a billion seeds and only grows one or two of those billions. So you don't know which one's going to grow. Plant it extra, <laughs> extra heavy. Uh, let's go to the next pain topic. This is a little different, but I want to talk about this one because this is a major epidemic in our country. My wife is a mental health counselor, and often she has had people who are addicted to street opioids, heroin, and so forth. How did they get addicted? Prescription opioids. And then it was more readily available to go get them on the street and now they're addicted. Well, let me go back to a case we had here in our valley. Um, no longer living here. I'm not going to mention names, but we had a lady that had been on the highest doses of pain meds that she could be prescribed the top level six times a day for 15 years. She said, I want off the pain medication. We said, okay, let's talk about the process and how you can get off of it. First, opioids drag calcium out of the body. They're acid, they leach calcium out of the body. And so they actually create a worse problem than you had to begin with. They actually, you have to ramp up and up and up on them to keep getting the pain relieving property. And all it's trying to do is block the pain. It's not trying to repair anything. So he said, okay, let's take a look at the process that's going on in your body and what repairs have got to be made. Well, needed calcium for sure, plenty of it. And we said, all right, you're in charge of your own body. You've got to decide how fast you're going to go, but mullein is your other critical key because mullein will take care of the pain and it will start the healing process. She chose to replace one dose with mullein per day. One of the six doses she replaced. A time later, week or two, she replaced another dose. We call it the bridging method. It worked for her. I have had people that have just simply said, the opioids aren't working, I'm gonna replace it with mullein. And then the caution is, take enough. You've gotta take enough mullein to get the pain to zero and keep it at zero, so you're not tempted to go back to the other direction. Which means you might be taking a cup of tea or a handful of capsules because it's just plant every hour for a few days and how you get the pain levels down. But it worked. Within a few months, she was completely off of the prescription. And the beauty of plant-based is once you bridged, she didn't need anything because she healed the damage. And it was only a few months more and she was completely done with taking the moment also. What kind of pain? Uh, I've done others, so I'm not going to specify that because hers was an, a phantom pain from an amputee, but I've had others who've been addicted 
from other problems, damaged back or whatever it was, and you just bridge it. You, you change it to the other. Get enough in there though. The principle is sufficiency. It's just plants. There's no um, damage from taking more. You can take as much mullein as is needed. If you end up drinking 15 cups of mullein tea, you're probably just healing something. You can go to the bathroom more often. That's your only outcome. Please. So you mentioned capsules. Does that mean you can take it by itself without the tea? Yes. So can you just like eat the plant or do you like sprinkle on your food or? Um, I've never sprinkled it on after it's dry because the hairs are a little irritating to the throat, but I have eaten the leaf directly. As long as those hairs are fresh, straight off, I prefer tea so you don't get that irritating hair stuck in the throat. It's not really a hair, it's just a really small plant fiber that's tickly. We have a question on the chat. Okay. So once it's dried, can it be taken by capsule? and be as effective as tea? My experience is yes. Another story. Brother-in-law, heart attack, in the hospital for months. Um, he was, opioids for him made him aggressive and uncontrollable. So he was hitting nurses and doing things that weren't socially acceptable. Um, and finally got out of the hospital months later, he wasn't healing. The, the, the cuts from open heart surgery were not healing. And I said, come on, just try mulling. Took him about six months of pain and not healing. He finally said, I guess I can try mulling. It's not going to kill me. I said, no, if you didn't die from a heart attack, mulling's not going to kill you. <laughs> he tried it. Suddenly, he starts healing. Those wounds that would not heal at all because his body wasn't getting the right materials, started healing and the pain was gone. And so, and that was just capsules. He was taking only capsules. I prefer tea for myself, but capsules do work. Russ. So if you have capsules, can you get the capsules? Uh, I wouldn't dump them in tea because you've got to filter it out and that powder is really hard to filter. Yeah, capsules taken as a capsule is about the only way it works. Another another question is, is it safe for children? Mullen as a tea is completely safe for children. There are no side effects to mullen. In fact, um, I have, while you're mentioning that, we have a 22 page research paper that my wife, that was her um, final paper for her class when she got her master of list. And we'll send that out if you want to just give a, um, enough information there to email it to you. Obviously, I'm not going to print a 22-page paper. And the other thing that will come with it is a single page on each of the other three plants we're covering tonight. Because while I'm spending more time on it, because there's so many powerful uses. In fact, if we don't move on pretty soon, we won't have time to cover the rest of the powerful uses of mullein, let alone the other four plants. One quick note, mullen for nerve rebuild. The other things that are necessary in nerve rebuilds is relaxes or a combination similar to it that's a nerve rebuilder and herbal calcium and fish oil. Those, the herbal calcium and fish oil are primarily for the nerve sheath and the relaxes is for the nerve itself. But mullen is a powerful help in that process. Okay. You can use any of the flaxseed or other oils. Um, use your own muscle testing to see what works for your body. Hey Fred, can you also mention that those people that may not get this list that are online watching with us, that they can email? Yeah, or just throw your information um, directly to the host and that'll save with the video. And, and so we'll email it to you. Just put your email and stuff in and request it uh, with a direct to the host. Um, let's go to glands for just a minute. Mullen is one of the plants, the only one that I'm aware of, that repairs glands in the body very rapidly. 
and Dr. Christer's Moen glandular system formula uh, is just Moen and Lobelia. That's the only two things that are in it. Lobelia is the guide herb, and Moen is the repair. And we're not here to talk about Lobelia. It's got a lot of other properties as well as being a guide herb, but that's how powerful. So if you have weak glands, that's the foundation, and then you take your food for the plant specific to rebuild that gland. Let's go to the next one. Mullen to heal the lungs. And I already mentioned the 21 page paper that's going around. Mullen is for lung damage of any kind, smoking, uh, asthmatic, so forth and so on. Mullen is a wonderful plant to heal the lungs. We'll mention the other one in just a moment that actually opens up the lungs and clears asthma that way. But Mullen is the rebuilder, the lung rebuilder. Next. For the virus we just went through that shut everything down last year, Mullen was my primary first thing. Why? Because it is antiviral. And if you look across here, antibiotic, antiviral, and anti fungal also. Anything that's highlighted all the way across, and Mullen is one of those, does all three of those. So it's an extremely effective antiviral and lung rebuilder, the two things that were primarily needed. If you've lost taste and smell, this is not the primary thing, it's one of the things. My wife had lost it for seven months. You can look at our website and we posted a how to rebuild your taste and smell uh, on the website. Questions about anything on this? I've only got one more Mullen slide and then we're going to jump to the next plan. Um, what's the difference in the effectiveness of herbs and essential oils? A really good question. For instant relief, essential oils are helpful if you know exactly what you're doing with those oils. For long term rebuilding, the herb has the whole plant property in it, whereas the essential oil has just the isolates that will come out with whatever process you're bringing those out with. They don't have the whole plant in it. So they're valuable as can be for those things that they're used for. They aren't as rebuilding because the whole plant is not there. Other questions? Let's go to the next slide. The yellow flower top there, you won't play that video, we've had enough time in Mullen. Um, the yellow flower top is for ear aids. Now, we ask what part of the plant can we use? The whole plant with Mullen. During the summer, while well, that yellow flower top is throwing flowers out, um, and I just happen to have one here that's, I don't know where the camera's at, but it's just a little teeny yellow flower, and you can see one or two on that plant over there. It will throw out uh, flowers for probably the next two and a half to three months. And this morning I went out and took a video, we won't watch it, it's um, extra to what we need. But there were bees all over those yellow flowers. And they were just as happy as could be jumping from flower to flower. I've got about 18 mullen plants in my backyard, and they were just moving from yellow flower to yellow flower. Now, children's earaches, adults' earaches, take that yellow flower, let it dry for just half a day, enough to get the, the moisture out of it down a little bit. Drop it in olive oil, or rather fill your jar with the flour and then pour the olive oil over it and let it transfer its properties. And you've got an earache remedy that works two ways. Name the two. We talked about pain. And it kills the viral infection or the bacterial infection. It's extremely effective on killing the infection at the same time. A lot of the um, combinations will put a little bit of garlic oil or something else with it. 
My experience is it's not needed. The mullein flower oil is sufficient to kill and aerate because it kills the infection and the pain at the same time. What I just use the question is what kind of olive oil? Extra virgin olive oil is all we ever buy anyway. So I don't know if that's a standard. <laughs> Sister Flake, is that a standard? What? Extra virgin olive oil, is that the only one we buy? Yeah. Uh, I think that's about the only one that, that typically is, is there. Uh, lots of other things that you can see there, coughs, bronchitis, asthma, other things. We'll talk more about those, but realize that mullein is one of those plants. That's why the 20 some page paper is so valuable. It's worth knowing the properties of mullein and having it in your own yard. So there, some of those little buckets on my tailgate will look like they aren't gonna live. It's just too late in the afternoon, they got dug up. Keep them watered, they'll recover. They recovered this morning, some of them got dug yesterday, they recovered this morning, they're all perky again. This afternoon they're going, it's too hot, I can't live. <laughs> they'll make it, just keep them, keep them wet and, and get them in a good spot ground and they'll, they'll make it. Because I've done this multiple years in a row, moved them out of the grass, put them over somewhere else and, and they make it. Brigham tea. How many of you have already played with Brigham tea? You can find it out in the back country, around your fences. All the way around us. Okay. All the way around us. It's everywhere around us. It stops growing at about 3,000 feet. So you will not find it after you get down out of our valley, uh, maybe halfway down the road. It just disappears. But you go up in any of the hills around us, you will find Brigham tea everywhere around us. Now, we want to talk about some of its properties. Let me start with a story. I met my wife. 13-ish years ago, and her son at the time, 11 years old, had just missed three weeks of school because of asthma. Middle of the winter, or whatever, whatever excuse it was, I don't remember the excuse, but he couldn't breathe, and he had not gone to school. He was so sick for three weeks. And I asked her, what are you doing? What do you typically do for asthma? All of that, yes, inhalers, nebulizers, and so forth and so on. And I just ask, have you tried Brigham tea? And she goes, I forgot about Brigham tea. I grew up in Las Vegas and St. George drinking Brigham tea all the time. I forgot about it. Guess what she did? She brewed up a big thing of Brigham tea. And what's this right here, Brigham tea? So I've got cups and Brigham tea. Uh, as a matter of fact, I probably ought to just cast this because you're going to want to take, it's a four ounce cup. There's not enough for much in there, but you want to taste it. The way we remember what things are is we look at them and we taste them and we feel them and smell them. And then you can remember. How did you get it dark? Oh, this is just normal dark. 20 minute. How do you make Brigham tea is the first needed question. A handful, I call it a spaghetti sized handful, in a pot, fill it clear up with water. And then you've got your Brigham tea boiling with a lid on for 20 minutes. If it's been picked in the fall, when it's the most potent, that darkness is going to be just natural. It's just going to be the way it is. So you don't just steep it, you actually boil it? It has to be simmering. And this sheet says how to make it. So those of you who are trying to write down recipes, you don't have to. It'll be emailed to you if you signed up for it. Brigham tea. Let's talk about some of its properties then. She took it, she filtered it very well. She put it in his nebulizer overnight. 
He woke up the next morning with no asthma, and he's never, that was 11 years old, he's 25 now, he's never had another asthma attack. Don't ask me how, I don't know enough about immunologies, but it worked for him. <laughs> Other properties of Brigham tea. It is an anti-asthmatic, we've talked about that. It will clear allergies. Now, here's a real quick, interesting story. Um, drop the grandkids off. This daughter has quite a few allergies. She dropped the grandkids off, said, we'll be back in three days. When she came back, she came in just completely stuffed up. I can't breathe. Do you have any, what's the common one? Yeah, any antihistamine. She named Benadryl or something. Sorry, we don't keep any drugs in our house. Um, what, are you, what are you trying to do? She described, she was all stuffed up. She couldn't breathe. Her throat was swollen, everything. Have you tried Brigham tea? I pulled out the stock, wherever it got to, gave her a little teeny piece, and she put it in her mouth. And she said, oh, the itching's already stopping. Yes, make me some Brigham tea. And it did. It works. It's a great anti-allergy, antihistamine. It works as an antispasmodic. It's a good blood purifier. The thing I love about it, it is a bronchial dilator. Instant bronchial dilator. So while you are boiling it, take a towel, lean over that pot that's simmering, Breathe it in as deep as you can breathe it in. Push it back out and breathe it in as deep as you can breathe it in. Five minutes of breathing treatment with Brigham tea boiling there is enough usually to open all the bronchial tubes back up again and clear the asthmatic attack or whatever other attack we're having. So this would be good for last year's virus for sure, right? In a nebulizer especially? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? And mullen because mullen heals the lungs. So, Simple, simple plants, but the properties are so powerful. They just work. They just work. Please. Can you it that way? Oh, perfect question. Because it's a stock, the one I passed around, wherever it got to, is just cut off today. That's as wet as it gets. Don't store it in plastic, though, because it needs to dry a little teeny bit. So I typically will either break it off, I cut it off. Please don't cut, let's talk about harvesting first. Only, can you bring that to me, Russ? I, I wanna show how much to take off. Only take off about 5% of each plant. We don't wanna kill the plant, thank you very much. And we don't want to cut it down into its stock level. I did that for integrity of showing. We take off only the part up here and leave some green. So I usually, it'll break at each node. Or you can take scissors and just snip it across like that. But leave some green because it'll regrow. You'll see where the deer or something have eaten it. They never go down, down past the green. They let it grow. This is about a spaghetti-sized handful to go into a pot for two or three quarts of water. So that's about the right amount thrown in a pot. Questions about harvesting first. Question about growing. Growing. So we're here. It, it is it's sensitive to grow. You will notice there are some landscapes around the church, for example. There is Brigham tea in that landscape. I don't know how they've got it to stay growing because most people that plant it 
over water and kill it. And it's got to be in the right kind of area. So I can't help you on that one. I have not been successful. <laughs> if you find some out in the background, can you uh, dig it up and transplant it successfully? Um, and if so, what type, what type of years is that? Because it grows all the way around here, I, I tend to, not to try and, and it'll only grow between 3,000 and 5,000 feet. So it's not just temperature related, it's mostly elevation related. 3,000, 5,000 feet, and it doesn't care the temperature, it freezes hard here, it goes to 115 here. So it's fine with the high desert, it's just a 3,000, 5,000 foot plant. And it will not grow outside of that range that I'm aware of. And this is only one of dozens and dozens of species around the world. This grows in China. This grows uh, throughout the desert west. Um, so harvest it in the fall. That's when it's the most viable. It has more energy in it in the fall. But if you need some, do not hesitate to go harvest it and use it because it's got medicinal properties in it all the way through. It's in the paper, but if I don't mention it, I'll wish I had because someone's going to miss it. Making the tea. You've taken your spaghetti-sized handful, you filled your pot, you boiled it for, simmered it for 20 minutes, you've turned it off, you've filtered it, and you kept the grinds or whatever you want to call these in the pot for tomorrow. You add a third more fresh or dried to the pot, bring it to boil, do that for six days. On the seventh day, you've thrown it away, cleaned your pot, and started over again on the next day. Why do you reboil it multiple times? There's some organic minerals that the body needs that do not come out in the first boil. Copper is one of those, and there's some others that are so valuable to clearing the allergies. They meet the needs of the body and clear the allergies. And that's why you use it day after day until the sixth day, pitch it, start over again. I have clients who have been using this. Um, problems since childhood, it's taken a few months for some of them, but their lungs are getting better, getting better, the mucus is going down, so forth, and it's taking time. So don't think that just because my son had, my stepson had an instant one-time treatment, it's gonna work out with everybody, it doesn't. Sometimes it takes months of diligence to get rebuilt from the damage. Decongestant, mild energy stimulant. Sometimes it's hard to find ephedra. This one's ephedra nevidensis. Ephed there's lots of them. It's hard to find the plant for cell because the ephedra name, how many of us are old enough to remember the ephedra problems that we had with some diet drugs a few years ago? I'm dating myself 20 some years ago. <laughs> And those ephedra drugs caused some real problems because they isolated out of the plant. As a whole plant, the energy stimulation of this thing is, mm, it's not much. The real energy benefit that I understand from it and that I see in others is that it's clearing the congestion out so you can get more breath in and you can get a better um, balance to life. So um, which is more effective, the tea or the, or eating it? Um, I've never eaten it, but there are several products that have powdered and put it in capsule form and they're still effective. If you're trying to clear allergies or something pretty significant, I always advise doing both. Make the tea, take the breathing treatment while you're making the tea, and then drink the tea during the day. The next day, make new, breathe it in while you're making it, and drink it throughout the day. Um, if you're finding something pretty advanced, I would suggest drinking as much as you can tolerate. How is the taste? 
<laughs> That's it's interesting that you all say it's good because for me, I don't mind it. I made a big pot this morning and drank a couple of cups just to refresh my memory. My wife loves it. I don't need it, and so it's not my favorite taste. But it's not bad. It's not something that's it's bad. Would it affect it if you like sweeten it with a little honey? Good question. I use a little honey, or sometimes I'll just put a little stevia in it. As I turn off the pot, I'll throw a small handful of stevia and put the, the lid back over. Because stevia is a plant, a leaf in the mint family that is sweet. And so I'll use that. Are we done with drinking tea? No. Can you tell us more about the blood purifier technique? Like, when would you use it for a blood purifier? Like, what kind of uh, what comes to mind when you think of blood purifier? Anytime there's a over, well, for example, allergies are two primary causes liver not cleaning out things properly and an over toxic level in the body. Both those work together actually. So this helps to clean out the toxic level and purify the blood. Does that mean we probably need to lower the amount of toxins coming in of all kinds? So maybe like spider bites or snake bites, anything? I've used something else on spider and snake bites typically. In the last two weeks ago, we talked about plantain. I use that internally and externally for those kinds of toxins. I'm talking about food-related toxins or environmental-related toxins. Uh, yes, if you're just trying to pull a poison out, plantain is my very first thing. And the other one we talked about last week, echinacea, two weeks ago, for bites, which are actually anti-poison. The other one is lobelia. Lobelia is actually a poison clear or an, uh, an anti-poison. It'll clear the poison out of the body or that's the right word. As a uh, internally, lobelia internally, echinacea externally, typically. We talked about the next slide there already. So if you want to jump that one, uh, you can leave it for a second. And just enough to let people notice how to make it. And when I put up the video, we'll leave this slide on a little longer so that it's there to, to read. Okay, let's talk about chaparral. We're in the season for chaparral right now that it has a bunch of white flowers on it. That's not typical. That's spring, and this one happens to be in a place where it's getting enough water to do that. Chaparral grows 3,000 feet and below. So they don't cross each other very much. I, I saw, I've seen occasionally Brigham tea and Chaparral in the same location, but it has to be right at that few feet they overlap one another. I'm going to pass this around, but first I'm going to mention a story. This grows all around the ledges and down almost to St. George, and then it stops about as soon as you get into St. George proper, because the elevation again is the key there. Chaparral is also known as greasewood and creosote bush. As I pass around, I want you to taste, pick a leaf or two off and taste it. The best way to remember and positively identify something when you need it is if you know what it tastes like. Because there are other plants out in the desert that might look a little similar, but there's no other plants that taste like this. Now the story. So pick off a leaf or two and taste it as it goes around. We lived in Pahrump, Nevada, which is again, high desert, but not quite as high because chaparral grew all around us. And I had one of our friends come up to me one day and say, Fred, I've got stomach cancer, what can I do? 
He was in his 30s. He was a biker dude, not the motorcycle style, the bicycle style, where he ride 100 miles before breakfast and so forth. And yet he had this cute little round belly. When his wife was pregnant, they both looked the same. And he had stomach cancer. And I said, you live with chaparral growing in your backyard. Start harvesting it, making a tea. This is a leaf, so it's a leaf tea. Just pour boiling water into the cup. Let it steep for 10, 15 minutes. He told me the next week he loved the chaparral tea. It tasted so good. Those of you who tasted it, how would that describe chaparral? He needed it. He loved it. It was delicious to him. And his energy started coming back. And he was riding his 100-mile bike ride before breakfast. And he was doing fine. Two months later, he came to me and says, Fred, do I have to keep drinking that chaparral? It is nasty stuff. He says, I think you're probably about time to stop drinking it then. <laughs> That's if it tastes good to you, it's very likely that it's good for you. And that's especially true of those kinds of things like chaparral that don't taste good. Now, for those of you who are trying to go, why did I put that in my mouth? It's the best way to remember, and it's such a small amount. Now, what have I done before? I drank whole quarts of that because I figured I needed it, and it tasted shudderingly wonderful. You take a drink and you go, <laughs> everything shudders. It all hurt for about a minute or two. And then you go, wow, that's energizing. It brought so much energy to my body. <laughs> so if you feel like you need it, make a cup or two of tea and just see how you do on it. That is chaparral, something as mild as red raspberry leaf tea, which is an extremely good blood cleanser has articles in the online thing that says, it'll cause abortion, it'll cause this, it'll cause that, when in fact it does exactly the opposite. So as you're searching for knowledge on the web, ditch the first four pages that all say WebMD and Rx this and, and medical that, and go to something that says herbal, and look, I put a, um, a search term in there that says properties of, and then put the Latin name in. If you can find the Latin name, put the Latin name in, because then you'll get actual properties of that plant and not get um, something that's trying to limit people from using it. Chaparral is known for the specific action in cancer and arthritis. It is considered to be a cure-all by many Indians. It is potent healer to the urethral tract and to the lymphatics. It turns up the system and rebuilds the tissue. It cleanses the lower bowel and turns the peristaltic muscles of the bowel. It's very bitter, but to the needy and courageous, it works fast for difficult conditions. On the sheet that will come out to you, there's two recipes for non-bad tasting chaparral tea. I've tried them both. I'm sorry, it doesn't completely mask the greasewood or creosote taste, but it does taste better. The one says um, chaparral twice as, no, four, two tablespoons of chaparral leaf, four teaspoons of elderflower, which is one tablespoon for those of you who convert, and two teaspoons of peppermint leaf. And they say that gets rid of the bitterness of the chaparral close, but not completely. And there's another recipe here that suggests too. So if you want to try um, to tone it down a little bit, but if you need it, just do it. I love the shutter that it gives. It's a wonderful shutter. Properties. And I'm guessing you've shared it so that they've seen this page. I'm just going to read through it then. 
Chaparral is an alterative. It cleanses the body. It's a gradual blood and that cleanser tones regulates the eliminated organs. So it helps tone up the body. Chaparral is anti-arthritic and anti-rheumatic, partly because it cleans out the toxins so well in the body. Chaparral is used to heal swelling and congestion of the lymphatic glands. It is one of those anti-venomous plants. If you have to be snake bit, chewing on some chaparral and then putting it on the bite might be a good idea. It's astringent. Yes, it is astringent. Those few leaves you tasted probably made your mouth just tighten right up. <laughs> so it's very, very definitely astringent. Uh, the curative, it cleans and purifies the blood by promoting the elimination processes of the body. It is diuretic lithotriptic. Let's define the lithotriptic side of that. The diuretic, everybody knows it increases urine output. Lithotriptic means it actually is a stone dissolver. It will take kidney stones and dissolve them very quickly. I can see Russ is going to be making him some big cupfuls <laughs> of chaparral tea. Uh, it is emetic in large doses. I've never thrown up by drinking a cup of chaparral tea, but I'll bet you if I drank three cups in a row, it would probably create that. So probably not a good idea to drink it too quickly. And it is tonic. It stimulates, energizes, and strengthens the body. So very, very powerful. I um, interesting question. He asked, "Can you buy chaparral as a tea?" It used to be that you could get it. I had a client who loved chaparral. She could not find it anymore. And I said, start harvesting and drying. A couple of things about harvesting your own. And just a, a broad, can you find all the herbs right now? Two thirds of every order I put in is not available right now. And has been that way for over six months. And I, that was never the case before COVID. I could get any herb I wanted, any time I wanted it at Good prices all the time. Now, two thirds of the uh, herbal things are not available. So, if it's something you need, please grow it in your yard and spend the time growing it and learning how to grow it. So, do you have this one? Like, have, and you said that it grows better mm -hmm. at lower elevations. Have you grown it, here? it will. It will not grow up here at all. Okay. Yeah, so it's it well. okay. yeah, it's definitely a lower elevation tea. If you need it, harvesting away from the road. Get, get off the road and harvest it where you're not within a quarter mile of lots of traffic. So take a hike back in, carry your, your bag with you and snip, snip off the tips. 5% of a plant, don't over harvest the plants. Yeah. We decided we were going to try to transplant a bunch of kids where they are because the day might come where the girl was talking about in the back of his kids stuff. So we transplanted three of those into our yards. He's down in St. George. You're down in St. George, and it will uh, grow. Only well, one of them took because we were, we were trying to find these little plants, and what happened is they had this, because they can live in the severe heat, that they need to go way down. Yeah. And they try to dig it up and just chop that off. Yeah. Well, one of them survives, and we got this plant in our yard. But we're not going to take anything off. Big. So they yeah. usually need some big. Big. Um, We just did it a couple months, couple months ago. And it, they're slow growing. Yeah, they're and the other thing about chaparral plant, you're going to put it somewhere where you expect nothing else to grow underneath it because it does kill everything underneath it eventually. It's one of those, um, it protects its own area by dropping things so that nothing can grow right below it. Traditionally used for aches and pains, pain and orient, arthritis, bladder problems, bruises, cancer, chicken pox, constipation, cuts, digestion, dysmenorrhea, genital urinary tract, hemorrhoids, kidney troubles, um, victoria, rheumatism, snake bites, stony deposits, stomach disorders, prolapsed uterus, 
inflammation of minor wounds, venereal diseases, stores, and tetanus. Uh, so lots of uses. You're going to do need to do more research in a book like the Herb Syllabus or Dr. Crisper's uh, School of Natural Healing to find out all those uses. We won't cover the others, but it it's primarily been known over the years as a very strong cancer curing plant. That's one of its well-known properties through the years. I oh thank you. I meant to answer the question of how to process it too because I've done it and ruined the blender. So it's grease wood. It stays greasy after it's dry. So it the leaves are small enough that just putting it on a screen or um, putting it in a, a dehydrator, low temperature, whatever will work. But that grease stays there. It's an oily plant. So if you're thinking you're going to powder it and put it in capsules to get rid of that taste, don't use your wife's blender to do it. Yeah. We just put it in a paper bag and stick it away. It's fine. Yes. And it stores best. The last three we've talked about, in fact, the next one also, these are all desert plants. Store them in a paper bag or a cardboard box because once they dry, uh, they can store in plastic after that, but I found it's just easier to just put it in a paper bag or cardboard box and, and store it that way. Uh, the one that's in my kitchen cupboard that I made this with this morning, my wife actually, it had been dry long enough, it went into a snap down plastic, but that's not typical for us. We usually just put a littler box up in the cupboard <laughs> and the bigger box down in the cellar and then we pick it once a year, harvest the big box for it. So we've done that for the year in the fall. Any other questions on Brigham tea before we jump to juniper berries? Now, juniper berries are just drying out because of the one fell off as I was picking it up. Because it's so dry right now, the ones I picked it off of, I saw hundreds and hundreds and literally millions. The ground now is completely covered with purple berries, like an inch thick. If you'd like to try one, feel free to pick a berry off and taste it because you're experiencing this. These are monosperma juniperus, juniperus monosperma. They're a one seed. So quick story on how this was discovered and it's in the page that will get emailed to you, but Dr. Christopher for years had used the um, multi-stone, the five to seven stone, to clear urinary problems. It's a wonderful, the five to seven stone one is wonderful to clear the bladder and rebuild the bladder and cure incontinence and other urinary problems. So he had a client come to him and say, what do I do for my incontinence? He said, just, I don't have time right now. I'm just headed out to a client appointment, but you just need juniper berries. Well, the guy said, oh, I've got that in my backyard. Two weeks later, he came back and he said, it's not helping. Dr. Christopher said, show me the berry you're using. He pulled berries out. He broke it open, it's a one stone berry. He said, oh, or a seven stone berry, a one stone berry. He said, oh, that's not the right one. You need the multi-stone one to clear the bladder problems. And I've got some here and he handed it to him. Throw the others away, they won't help you on that. And he says, oh no, I'm keeping those because since I've started eating these berries, my insulin need has dropped dramatically. And so he said, tell me more about that. Come to find out juniper berries, juniper is monostone, what we call cedar berries, is the uh, pancreas rebuilder of all three kinds. So Dr. Christopher's pancreas formula has almost completely only that small berry. 
16 parts of this and five other things to kill infection and a few other odds and ends. But it's just cedar berries. And it tastes like cedar. I was, eat them like this? Yeah. I had pancreas problems. So at one time I was eating several a day and just trying them and, and using them that way. So are you saying that there's two different trees, one that grows one seed berries and one that grows both times? Yes. Do we have both of those? Or do we just go and break I, the berries? And I've them? seen a very few of the multi-stone, but they don't grow in our valley. Okay. And, and I'm not sure I recognize them from a distance, so I have to stop and break open. So do the trees look the same? The not completely. They don't look completely the same. For those who recognize them, they don't look 100% the same. But I don't recognize them. Yeah. I have to stop and see which one's which. So you just break them open and it goes either one seed or multi seed. Yeah, five to seven seeds. In it. And you can usually see from the outside that it's a seven seed because it's kind of lumpy and bumpy. Mm -hmm. So it says gather berries that need to be grown this well, I would have gathered them last week before they started dropping them personally. If you need these, get out in the hills right now because they just fell this week. And they're an inch thick carpet on the ground right now. And that was one of the few branches that had them left on it. And so I snipped it off and carefully set it down to keep them from all falling off because they were falling every which way as I was sniffing. So yes, if you need it, harvest it now, or go get it now. Or if you just need the pancreas rebuilt, Dr. Christopher's pancreas formula works. The other one, the bladder one, um, with the pink, the other, uh, the juniper berries. Uh, so for the, the three to seven stones, is good for the bladder. It's good for bladder rebuild incontinence and those kinds of things. Any other questions on this one? How much do you think you need for water people? I don't know. Depends on the individual. Um, each person guides themselves on that kind of stuff. That's why muscle testing is so critical because you've got to know your own muscle testing to be able to take care of your body's needs. And we'll be back in two weeks.